Hi there and welcome to the Middle Earth Play by Mail fan channel. What I'm wanting to talk about today is how you can train your characters. This is a follow on from an earlier video I've done on naming characters. So if you haven't seen that one, you might want to pause and scroll through and, and locate it. But this is very much the follow on. So you've gone and you've named some nice shiny new characters but they're fairly low level. Maybe they're only rank 30, maybe they're multi-class and only rank 10 in a specific field. How is it you can increase their skills so they can go off into the big bad world and do useful things in disrupting your enemy? And this is really important because as I've said many times on this channel, Middle Earth Play by Mail is primarily a character based game. Now, while there is terrain and uh, nations and population centers and armies and magic items and lots and lots of other wonderful things. I would say it's primarily a character based game because you interact with the world of Middle Earth through the characters that you have and the orders that they give. So you want as many characters as you can to maximize the number of orders you can give and you want them to be as high a skill level in their ranks as they can do in order that when they give those skills they can do them effectively. And that's what we're going to be looking at today, how to increase a character's skill levels. Now, a character's skill levels will be in one or more of four uh, attributes. There is commander, there is agent, there is emissary, and there is also mage. There is a fifth attribute of stealth, but that's not one that's related to any orders and uh, you can't increase it unless you happen to find an artifact to give it to someone, but you can't train stealth up, so we're ignoring stealth today. Every skill will increase if you succeed in particular actions that are based on that skill. Not all actions based on that skill uh, will um, help you. Some of them are automatic actions and they won't give you any increase at all. But a lot of them do and you can find out which ones they are within the rulebook. Now it tends to be that if a skill is quite hard to do, you can get quite a big increase, say between 1 and 10 points, by achieving a, a success at a skill that is hard to do. The problem is this puts a low level character in a bit of a chicken and egg situation. Because let's say you've got a rank 10 agent and you think, well, if he goes off and assassinates someone or kidnaps someone, that's really hard to do. So if he pulls that off, he'll suddenly get lots of points really quickly. The problem is he's not going to be good enough to do those really high level skills. And so he won't pass the skill check and he won't go up in skill. Fortunately, however, for each of the four um, skill types, there is an automatic skill, which as long as you are in the right circumstances, you are guaranteed to execute successfully and will get usually between one and five points. Now for the commander, the two options that you have for automatic skills require your commander to be in an army. And if they're in an army, they can issue order 430, which is put troops on maneuvers, and that will increase their command skill by between one and seven points. Or if they are in charge of the army, not just in it, but the commander, the overall leader of the army, they can issue 435, put army on maneuvers. This will increase their skill by one to five points. And also any other commander in the army will get another one to five points. For the agent, the automatic skills are to do with guarding. 605, guard location, and 610, guard character. These will give a um, increase of between one and five points whenever you issue them. If you're successful, in foiling um, an attempt to um, by another agent uh, to mess around with the place you're guarding or the character you're guarding, you will gain another one to five points per attempt. But normally it's very difficult to persuade the opposition to send really rubbish agents to try and steal from the place you are guarding. So that's just a bonus if it happens. Emissaries, their automatic skill is 520, which is influence your population center's loyalty. 
Obviously, for this, you have to be at one of your own population centers, but you will get between one and five points with it if you do, and your population center will get a little bit of loyalty. I should have said for the agent as well, obviously, guarding a location or guarding a character needs there to be a location or a character to guard. So if your agent is in an empty hex with no one else, he won't be able to do an automatic skill order. Finally, the mage. The mages get order 710 Prentice Magery, which also gives a, an increase of between one and five points. But you do have to be in one of your own population centers to issue it. Now, the contested skill checks, um, which will give you bigger boosts sometimes, it could be one to seven, it could even be one to ten extra points, uh, are usually linked to your character doing the things that your character is expected to do. So for a commander, if you're going off and fighting sea, fighting battles and sieging cities and um, all of those heroic army-based things, or if you're threatening population centers or fortifying your own population centers, they can increase your skill ranks. For the agent, multiplicity of options. There is anything to do with stealing. You know, there's um, any sabotage that you do, uh, assassinations, or kidnap, or counter-espionage. All the things you will want a halfway decent agent going out and doing will be training up that agent, which is a good thing. For emissaries, again, creating camps, improving population centers, so getting camps to be villages, villages to towns, and so forth. Doing aggressive actions, such as recruiting double agents, bribing other characters, or influencing the loyalty of enemy population centers. All of these will give a bonus to an emissary skill rank if he is successful in issuing the order. And what options are there for the mage? Unfortunately, it's still just the one thing. 710 Prentice Magery, one to five points. You have to be sitting in one of your own population centers. This is one of the reasons many people feel that mages are one of the weaker character classes, because when they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, they don't get such a fast acceleration in their skill ranks as other characters. On the other hand, mages are often a little bit more defensive, maybe sitting back and gathering information. So, you know, you've got time to develop them. Um, you know, commanders, well, yes, they will increase their skills going off to battles, but they could die in battles. Same with agents going around stealing things or assassinating people. That's high risk. So for the mage, it's a bit more slow and steady as she goes. Finally, I ought to say that if your character wins a challenge, a one-on-one -on -one personal challenge against another character, you will gain an increase. It can be between 1 and 15 points. However, you're only going to get the higher end of those points if you really beat someone really against the odds. If your um, newly minted hobbit goes and fights a Nazgul and beats the Nazgul, you can expect them to get a huge increase in skill ranks. If, however, the Nazgul turns around and neatly slots the hobbit, that Nazgul is going to pick up one or two. Beating a hobbit, run of the mill for Nazgul. So, um, a couple of points just to mention before I go into particular strategies for uh, raising um, skill levels. The first one is that the increase that you get is not a random number between 1 and 5 or 1 and 10, whatever it says in the um, book. It seems to be related to what your current skill rank is. So if you're a rank 10 commander and you uh, put the order to put troops on manoeuvres, the one to seven points you're going to get, it's going to be in the upper range, five, six, maybe seven points. If you're a rank 90 commander, you'll probably only get one or two points. So um, it's harder to get characters moving up quicker as they um, advance in skill rank. But of course, for commanders, agents and emissaries, they have access to skills that are hard to do, but at high levels they'll be able to do, which will give them a wider range 
of uh, outcomes when they get those points. So maybe they will still keep progressing quite nicely. Mages, this is where they do slow down because you can only ever issue that one order which will give you a rank one to five uh, boost. If you're a rank 30 mage, you might get three, perhaps four points. Um, so yeah, over three turns, that might take you to 40. But when you're a rank 70 mage, and you're only going to get one or two points, to get from rank 70 to rank 80 really will take some time. The second thing is, with skills, it's important to plan long term. You're not going to get a new character at rank 30 up to rank 60 or 70 and off doing exciting, tricky orders, you know, within a few turns. It's important that you plan ahead, but that you don't neglect slipping in those training orders um, as much as you can, because you want to make sure that your low and mid-level characters in 5, 10, 15 turns, however long it is, become some of the great characters of the game by making sure you're always keeping your eye on the ball and slipping in those training orders and upgrading them where you can. So what strategies do people use um, relating to specific classes? Well, first of all, for the army commander, uh, a very good one is to have a uh, new commander that's relatively low level as a backup in an existing army. You then have the main army commander issue the order to put the whole of the army on maneuvers, which increases their skill by between one and five points, and also the new commander between one and five points. The new commander doesn't have to issue an order for that, so they have a spare command order and they can put troops on maneuvers. That's the automatic skill which will increase their, their, that commander skill by one to seven points. As both these orders go through, you will have an uplift of between two and twelve points, one to five plus one to seven. And if you're a fairly low level commander, maybe ten or twenty points, you're going to be at the upper end of that two to twelve range. So within a few turns, you can start to get commanders to a decent level quite quickly. If you have several small commanders you're wanting to train and you can put them all in the army, they can all benefit from the one to five points from the putting army on maneuvers order. Uh, this is useful if uh, you're moving an army from one place to another and you're stopping at a point where you're not at one of your own population centres where you're wanting one of your commanders to be able to uh, recruit. So that's a good thing. Um, agents, normally a pattern with agents is you use them to guard until they're up to about rank 40. Then they can go and steal, maybe from a friendly camp. Uh, so a uh, an ally who's upgraded you to friendly, you go and steal there once or twice. Um, because you'll get the bigger bonus if you pass um, a steel check and you'll get between 1 and 10 points there. And then maybe as you get a little bit higher up to around high 40s into the 50s, you can go and steal from enemy camps. Again, if they're not fortified, it's better if they're in mountains, so you can pick up a little bit of gold. That's cool. And then by doing that, advance them to around about agent rank 70, at which point they're good to go and go and do some assassinations. Emissaries, when they're named, if assuming that they're named at rank 30, they can stay in your capital for, I would normally say, a couple of turns, influencing uh, loyalty up a bit until their rank is in the high 30s or up to about 40, and then they can go out and create camps. If you move them out at rank 30 to create camps, it's a little more high risk. There's a chance that the create camp order might not go off, in which case they don't gain any bonus. You've just wasted a bit of time. If they do create a camp, that camp will be created with a loyalty of half their skill. So a rank 30 emissary will create one at rank 15 loyalty. It's already borderline that it will be rebellious and will just dissipate. So if you can get nearer 40, let's say rank 38, you'll be creating them with 19 loyalty. It's a bit more wiggle room on the loyalty. Then for the mages, because they're limited purely down to uh, apprentice magery, just sit them in a population center somewhere. They can be good in a capital because that allows them to also issue some nation orders such as uh, using the whole nation, selling goods, or it could be, um, you know, moving goods around. Sometimes keeping characters in capital, it's a bit of an obvious place for enemy agents to come and look for things, people to assassinate. So maybe if you've got a mage, perhaps they've got a palantir they're using to scry each turn, or um, if they've got an artifact, they're learning spells off, go and move them to a population center um, and just sit them there issuing apprentice magery and 
filling in something else for their other order until they get to a decent and useful level. Once they're up to about rank 40, uh, they can start learning easy level spells in preparation for when they're rank mid 50s, learning uh, higher level spells such as... Um, you know, some of the medium level spells. Uh, I ought to do something about mages and spells. I'll, I ought to do a video on that sometime. Watch this space. I will do that. Right, so they're the main strategies for Commander, Agent, Emissary and Mage. I just want to finish off before um, the end of this by mentioning a couple of slightly more exotic ways of trying to hothouse skills that I've heard of. I haven't seen put into practice, so I've seen them in theory more than in practice. If you've seen these used, do say so in the comments down below. I'd love to hear how it turned out. The first one relates to having companies which have both, uh, which have lots of emissaries and one agent in, and it's relying on two skills. For the emissaries, it's uh, recruit double agent at number 500 in the turn order, and for the agent, it's number 600 counter espionage, um, slightly later in the turn order at 600. So, how it works is you get um, two companies each of a single nation who are friendly to each other. They're on the same side. This is something you're doing to buff each other. Let's say you have four high-level emissaries in each side and one reasonable level mage. Every emissary of nation A issues recruit double agent on every emissary of nation B. And nation B does the same the other way round to nation A. Okay, so hopefully they will all recruit the opposite, their opposite numbers as double agents. That each 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 uh, successful recruitment buffs that emissary by one to ten points. And here's the clever bit: six hundred counter espionage. The agent issues it, and they check every character from their nation in that hex, and every one they pass the check for, and they discover happens to be a double agent, they gain one to five points for every one. So if you've got four new double agents um, and you then counter espionage and undo the uh, double agentness uh, of each one, double agentness, is that a phrase? It is now. Then you will get four times one to five for each one. So you will end up with a, an uplift of four to 20 in one turn. That's kind of cool. The downside is, is that it does require you tying up quite a few medium to high level emissaries and agents for a few turns while you try and accelerate this through. And quite frankly, they could be off doing other things. But people have mooted it as a strategy. The second uh, interesting strategy I've come across involves using challenges by low level characters. Now I have seen this done um, at the start where let's say a nation's got a particularly rubbish character they don't want and their choice is well I could retire them but they've only got a challenge rank of about 12. So what I could do is move them to one of the really powerful characters that one of my allied nations has and this rubbish rank 12 challenge rank character will issue a challenge and uh, more than likely lose it and that will give a 1 to 15 boost to the powerful character that they have issued the challenge to. And from the perspective of the powerful character, they don't even have to spend an order in order to get an increase. So for them, it's just free points. It is slightly high risk. There is a slight chance, um, even with a large gap, 50, 60, 70 points in challenge rank, that the dice rolls just go wrong and the little tiny challenge rank character that you want to get rid of rolls really high and uh, accidentally kills the great lord of middle earth he was supposed to be sacrificing himself to train up so it's not without its risks but we like to live for danger but anyway you can abuse this mechanic a little bit by naming rank 10 emissaries OK, now imagine you've got a multi-class character at your capital and within his multi-class suite of skills, he has got a little side order of a rank 10 of emissary. He will then issue the order to name an emissary. It will cost 5000 gold and it will use up an emissary order. So that's probably why you don't see it being done. Uh, but by doing that, you then get a rank 10 
emissary. He has no other skills because the name emissary order just goes up to the skill rank of the character who is naming, which we're deliberately using a rubbish emissary to do it. A rank 10 emissary has the lowest challenge rank in the game, a challenge rank of a mere five points. You could sneeze on them and kill them. This rank 10 emissary, five challenge rank, then moves to the character in the, your, your, the friendly opponent nation that you're wanting to um, throw themselves against. By friendly opponent nation, I mean someone who is on your side so you can issue a challenge. You can't issue a challenge to your own characters, I don't believe. Um, he goes off, fights them, loses. They get a free increase in their bonus. If your nation has oodles of money... You can name a rank 10 emissary next turn. That rank 10 emissary names a rank 10 emissary and moves off to go and fight. The following turn, the original rank 10 emissary dies in combat. Rank 10 emissary number two names another rank 10 emissary and moves out to go and fight. And with this, you can have this continuous chain of hapless rank 10 emissaries going off to issue challenge uh, challenges and basically training up your team. So if you've ever seen that done in a game, I'd love to hear from you. Do say so in the comments down below. Well, I think that's me about uh, covered everything I can think of for training up characters. Unless you have come across some interesting ideas yourself, do write them below. Do share it round. It's always good to share knowledge within the game. Uh, I'm about finished for now. So uh, until the next video comes out, I hope you're having a good day wherever you are. I hope you're enjoying the games you're in and take care.